Welcome to all things in Christ. This is uh, session 22, I think. The second house, the greater house. I'm going to be sharing about just what I started sharing during conference. In Ephesians 1, verse 9 and 10, it says, He made known to us the mystery of His will according to His kind intention, which He purposed in Him with a view to an administration of the fullness of times. That is, the gathering together into one all things in Christ. Of late, I've been looking at just this testimony of Christ in His death, burial, and resurrection. I've drawn the cross here in the middle just just as the division between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. The Old Covenant is the ministry of death. The Old Covenant is the First Covenant. It, it, it is the administration of the law, that which has jurisdiction over the first man. It is, it is that first creation. The New Covenant is, is the things that I've drawn on this side of the cross. The things that are represented, representing the New Covenant is Solomon's Temple. This is the house of increase. During the beginning of the book of Samuel, we have a time where the tabernacle of Moses is up on Mount Gibeon, and the Ark of the Covenant, the very Holy of Holies, is taken out of there. It's brought up to Zion during the administration of David. And there's 40 years between these two. Until Solomon builds the house. This house represents the resurrection. It represents the church. It represents the new covenant. In Corinthians 15, it says that the first man was of the earth, earthly. The second man is the Lord from heaven. There's two houses here. These two houses represent two men. They are... This is the house under the administration of Saul. Saul is a representation of the first man, Adam, the soulish man. The house is in this condition as a testimony of Adam. Christ came as the last Adam. And He put off that whole house. And He came as the fullness that filleth. He came... I'm going to draw the ark. And that glory, that fullness represents the Spirit. It was brought over here and, and filled this whole new house, this house of increase. In this house, the Holy of Holies was ten times bigger. In this house, there were ten lampstands. In this house, there were ten tables of showbread. And this house, this house represents in the Father's house, there are many dwellings. This is, this is the body of Christ. This is a spiritual house. This is the house that we were in our own identity. This is a crucified man. This is the man that Christ became. He who knew no sin became sin. And He brought all men to death here on this cross. He rose from the dead and He's filling an entire whole, a whole new house, a new creation. First creation, new creation. First covenant, second new covenant. First man, the second man. These houses represent a man. And so the writer of Hebrews says, the heavens are my throne and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you build for me? And where is this place of my rest? All these my hands have made. All these things have been, saith the Lord, 
but unto this man will I look. The Bible in basic English, this is in Isaiah 66, verse 2 says, Unto this man only will I give my attention. The house represents a man. That man is Christ. Our salvation is a person. It's not a thing that we attain to. It's not a thing that we possess. Salvation is a person. It is a man that must be revealed in our heart. All these things are testimony. They are testimony of the coming and the appearing of Christ in you. During conference, there's a brother uh, from Colorado, Otto Schultz, was sharing with me. He was talking to me about how the testimony is like somebody. He said, if somebody were to come to me and tell tell me that Mike Tyson was the hardest hitter in the world, that uh, if he that person showed me all the YouTube videos of Mike Tyson knocking people out, uh, you would see the testimony of Mike Tyson being the hardest hitter. You could go through all the statistics and look at all the evidence of him knocking all these people out. But when Mike Tyson comes into the room and punches you in the face and you're knocked out, you've come from testimony to substance. All these things, even our teaching this time here together is is testimony. They're only for one purpose. That God would reveal His Son in us. So that we, our hearts would come to see Christ Himself. To, to see the apocalypse of the cross, the end of us. That Father would, Father would reveal that Son in us. That we would be made to know our end. I see that testimony of us, our hearts coming into participation with the cross. What does it mean to be crucified with Christ? I see all that right here. I see a man, uh, uh, um, the first man rejected. The new man. Christ. Filling His house. And the body. Just like, just like a seed. Let's say this is the seed. And it was at the center of this house, just like it sh- a seed would shed the husk in the outward part and be carried over here and, and grow into a new, and grow up, risen above the earth. It's like a new, this, is, this new creation is like a new garden. Completely separate from this other. This is like the old wineskin. The new wine, the new wine skin. If you were, if you, if you've ever seen, I found it in one of the in a Bible dictionary where it showed the bottles, the the skins in the Middle East were basically made of it might be a goat or of some other animal that they would sew up and sew it up tight so that it would it would hold water and it would be filled with wine and as that new as that new wine would ferment it would expand and grow and it would be a body you if you were to look at the new wine skin and the new wine in there would be a, a, it would it would bloat up into the shape of a body it's a testimony of Christ filling his house. Uh, All these testimonies, even in nature, if you have a a caterpillar and a butterfly, the caterpillar sheds its skin as it goes into the chrysalis. And and it's it's entirely new. A butterfly uh, isn't just a caterpillar that's grew wings inside the chrysalis. It's just completely reduced to goo. There's nothing of the old. This is the soulish man. Where it says, The natural man receiveth not the things of God. This man is me. 
It is Adam. This man is a corporate man, if you will. It is Christ alone, this same Jesus, filling this house. In Isaiah 62, the Lord speaks, He says, Thou hast been a crown of beauty in the hand of Jehovah, and a diadem of royalty in the hand of thy God. It is not said of thee any more forsaken. And of thy land it is not said any more desolate. For to thee is cried, My delight is in her, and to thy land married. For Jehovah hath delighted in thee, and thy land is married. This, this is Isaiah 62, verses 2 through 5, in the Young's literal. No more is it said of your land, desolate. This house was left desolate. This man was left desolate. This man was rejected. He represents every, every first man and throughout the whole testimony of the Scriptures. The first man, Adam, sinned against God. And eventually, in Genesis chapter 9, Adam dies. And the first man to be born after Adam's death is Noah. It's the man of rest. This man of rest, God, he found favor in sight of the Lord. In the eyes of the Lord, he found favor. And so the Lord looked past Noah and he saw his son, Jesus Christ. And he said, in the language is very clear, that every man died in the flood. All creation was executed. Every animal that had the breath of life in its nostrils died. And no one was spared except for Noah. And then it says those were that were with him. Just like, just, this is all a testimony of Christ. One man died for all, therefore all men died. It's, it's an extreme judgment. And then Noah... In his ark, it says it had three levels. Came to land on Mount Ararat where the curse was reversed. That's what Ararat means. The curse reversed. And there, the Lord put a, a rainbow. And He says, And I will look to the bow to remember the everlasting covenant that I have made. In the Old Covenant, it says that God's eyes were sought to and fro for a man. But, there was, but I found none. But after Christ came, after He brought the judgment to all mankind, after He was raised up from among the dead, the Lord says, unto this man will I look. Unto this man only will I give my attention. And so the Father's, the Spirit of God is not grieved any longer. He sees His Son. His, his view is fixed on His Son. He does not deviate from the Son of His love. He has great pleasure and satisfaction in this one. And this is the one that fills the house of God. This is the one who lives. And so the whole story about Noah and the judgment of the flood and the, and the restoration becomes a testimony of Christ in the church. It's, it seems very extreme to say that God 
only looks on his son, but he, he does not anymore look on man. He looks towards his son, Jesus Christ, and he sees no other. And this is the grace of God. We do not find favor in God's sight. Christ in you is the beloved. And the Father's relationship is with this Son. Look at what he says. My delight is in her. This is a completely new, a completely new creation. This house. This new man. At, at my house... Uh, I have really poor soil and I've, I've worked very hard to, to make my soil good. I've worked very hard to remove the rocks and, uh, and I still in our garden is just completely full of weeds. And uh, recently I've taken to burning the weeds with a, it's like a flamethrower that you hook up to a propane tank. But still, Eventually, even, even the weeds that are burned out of the garden grow back. But I have a completely separate, I have a completely separate garden. And these are raised beds that I made for my wife. They are where we trucked in good ground. Soil that didn't have any rocks in it. Soil that was already full of worms and all the good things and the nutrients that were in, in the soil. And my wife planted flowers in there. And, uh, and it so quickly filled up this raised bed so quickly filled up with good seed that there are no weeds in it. There are no, there's no weeding. There hasn't been for years. There's this raised bed. It's up above the grass. It's up above the weeds. And the weeds aren't coming into it. As a matter of fact, she's, she's planted some uh, strawberries that are putting out sisters and they're overflowing out of the raised beds and down into the to the grass. There, it's, it's going the other direction. It's coming down. And as I was making these beds, the Lord began to speak to me about the good ground in, in Mark chapter 4. And I began to see the unfruitful soil, the desolate land, as the land that the cares of this world the deceitfulness of riches, the, the enemy steals the word in this man. The cares of this world choke out the word in this man. The, but there's another, there's another garden. And it's the church. And the Father looks at her and says, My delight is in her. I keep her. It was this, it was this garden that, that the Lord appeared to Saul of Tarsus and said, Why persecutest thou me? Yes, yes, yes. He, he was talking about the church. But the Lord didn't say, Why persecutest us? He says, Why persecutest thou me? The Father looked past many and saw one. The Father sees one son in this good ground. That's what I'm seeing here. It is not said of thee anymore forsaken. In thy land it is not said anymore desolate. But my delight is in her and thy land is married. Many times the Lord declared His view of His body to the church. that they may be one as we are one. It's a, it's a view is the Father seeing His Son and not deviating from that. A desirable vineyard and I respond to her, I, Yahweh, am its keeper. Every moment I water it, lest any lay charge against it. Night and day, I keep it. And so, 
when I read the parable of, of the sower, I see an abiding parable. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, to those about him, with the twelve, he asked them of the parable. He said to them, To you it has been given the secret of the reign of God, of the kingdom of God. But to those who are without, it's in parables, so that that seeing they may not see, so that perceiving they may not see, they may not hear and may not understand lest they turn and their sins may be forgiven them. Those that were with Jesus, they had. Those that were with Jesus Christ had the hearing ear with them. And these are they, by the way, where the word was sown. And whenever they may hear, immediately the adversary comes and he takes away the word that hath been sown in their hearts. And these are they, in like manner, who on the rocky ground, or whenever they hear the word, immediately with joy they receive it. They have not root in themselves but are temporary and afterward tribulation or persecution comes because of the word and immediately they stumble and these are they who toward the thorns are sown the original language is really really describes the path, the seed falling on the path the seed falls on the rocky ground the seed falls among the thorns But the seed falls into the good ground. It fills this this house. It falls into it. And so, I see the many souls. There are many dwellings in my Father's house. This this house has many lampstands, many tables of showbread in this part. But there's one spirit, there's one body. This is one new man. This, this garden is like a raised bed. It's the one that's cared for. The parable of the sower is not about us looking to ourselves and to, our, to self-energy to make our ground less rocky. It is not about us using self-energy and soulish energy to make to resist the devil, to, to uh, turn from the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. It, it is about abiding in this one and knowing Him. Knowing the, the man that fills God's house. Know, in knowing Him. And it's about, just like Martha was busy, Martha and Mary, one of them was busy about many things, but We are to know the one thing. It's to know Christ and to abide in Him. Not in this man, but abide in this is the church. She is the good ground. It seems contradictory to to my natural mind to say how can Christ be both the seed and the ground? It is because Christ fills the, the God's field. God fills it. And He gives it His own identity. When, when, a, when soil is filled with wheat, that soil has a new identity. It's been changed. It's become a wheat field. It's been married. It's been filled. When you, 
When, when there is a marriage, there is a new name. There is a new identity. Listen, hear that here. He is giving to thee a new name that the mouth of Jehovah doth define. God's Spirit defines. God's, God Himself stands and is the definition. And now thou hast been a crown of beauty in the hand of Yahweh, a diadem of royalty in the hand of thy God. And it is not said of thee any more forsaken, and of the land it is not said any more desolate. For thy, to thee is cried, My delight is in her. When Jesus appears to, to Saul, He says, Why persecutest thou me? He looks past the church. He looks past the many and He sees the one. Why persecutest thou me? What you have done to the least of these, you've done it unto me. The Lord has come in this house. He is present. In Job 19.25, Job says, I'm, I'm reading from the, the first half of this first verse. Job 19.25 is from the Young's Literal. Verse 26, I'm reading from the American Standard it says, I have known my Redeemer, the living and the last. Verse 26. He will stand upon the earth after, after my skin. Even this body is destroyed. Then without my flesh, I shall see God. I know it's, if, if you're familiar with this verse, you're, you're used to hearing the King James and many other translations. It says, Yet in my flesh I shall see God. But I read some of, the, some of the, what the translators were saying in the Browns and, Browns and Root commentary. It, and uh, basically the translators of the King James said, Well, it says literally, out From my flesh I shall see God. So they must be in their flesh. So let's just change it. Make the, the Scripture say exactly the opposite of what the original language say. This is, this is what the original language says. Without my flesh, Bible in basic English says, out from my flesh. Young's literal says, from my flesh. It's, it's, it's apart from my flesh. It's, this is the same thing as what, what I'm seeing here. Just like, just like I see it sheds the outward man. It's here. It's out from. This like death, burial, and resurrection. In the burial, what's, what's going on in the burial? It's the removal. It's the putting away of the, the dead. It is a burial begins with Someone closing the eyes of the dead man to everything outward. Just like Paul said, the world is crucified to me. And then and then what's put away in a barrel? The dead, the flesh, and I'm crucified to the world. What's what's going on? It's the it's it's the removal of all that we see according to appearances, all that we see according to the flesh. Therefore we judge no man according to the flesh. No, though we once knew Christ according to the flesh, know we Him no more. This, after this putting off of all that is old, all the external, even the law and the world, the law that, is, that has jurisdiction over this man, it's all put off in the cross. Nailing it to the cross. Christ comes into a whole new creation, a whole new garden, risen, and we abide there. Not, not bringing our own sight. I don't know. I see a, I see a, 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 
that lampstand over here? That's left over here. That lampstand didn't, didn't come over here. These lampstands were all new. Brand new. New mine. Filled. A new house. Filled with new... Altogether different. We don't bring our, under, our own understanding here. That's put off. But you know the natural mind says, "Well, we got you know we got to get our own resurrection. We got to get our own body. We got to get our own stuff some glad day when this life is over." So let's just change this Bible. Let's make it so uh, it says, "I know my Redeemer lives, and uh, He will stand." And yet in my flesh I still get see God's got got to mean that. But that's exactly the opposite of what of what was written here. In Job, I have known my Redeemer, the living, the last. He will stand upon the earth, and after my skin is, even this body is destroyed, then without my flesh I shall see God. earth bringeth forth her shoots and as a garden causes its sown things to shoot up so the Lord, so the Lord Yahweh causeth righteousness and praise to shoot up before all nations Unfruitful soil is a heart that identifies in the first man and in the first old covenant age instead of in the day of Christ. In Matthew 13, 22, Jesus described the thorns as being the anxiety of this age and the deceit of riches. The anxiety of this age. The age before the cross. The Mosaic economy. Jesus only recognized two ages. He said, if anyone leaves lands or wives or sisters or mothers, all, all that stuff, he shall, he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. Life is here. Christ is the life. And that's Mark chapter 10, verse 30. In the age to come, eternal life. Jesus didn't ever describe or teach three ages. It's, it's, it's commonly thought that there was an age of the law, and then now there's an age of grace, and then there will be a second coming, well, there will be another age uh, Jesus said that there was just two ages. It's the day, it's, it's the day of Christ and the night. It's the administration of the law and then the administration of the fullness of times. The cross ended the first age and separated the new earth from the old forever. So it's written, But now, once for all, at the completion of the ages, He hath appeared for the putting away of sin through the sacrifice of Himself. Jesus, this, the, the Holy Spirit's very clear that the cross is the completion of the ages. The seed does not grow in Adam. Yes, there's... there's one, one of the kinds of good ground, the rocky soil, the seed grows roots, but because it has no depth, it can't grow. Look at the original language, especially in Luke chapter 8. The seed falls on the wayside, on the rocky soil, among the thorns, and then it's in the good ground here, into the good earth. The church is a good ground. 
Because the father, the husbandman, keeps it. Because he, his son fills it. Soil has no ability to improve itself except for the seed. The soil is completely dead. The husbandman is the father. He is the sower. He works the soil. He makes the ground good. He waters. We can only abide in His vineyard and rest. We are made the vessel of His increase. He said, so is the kingdom of God. As if a man who should cast seed into the ground and should sleep and rise night and day and the seed should spring and grow up he knoweth not how for the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself first the blade then the ear and after that the full corn in the head this is in this parable Jesus is describing us as the man sowing the gospel and we're not the soil. Here the man here is not Christ because Jesus knows how the seed springs and grows but this man knows not how. In this parable it's the seed and His work that produces the increase. This garden bringeth forth fruit of herself. It is the seed's effort growing and turning to the light Good ground is so filled with the planting of the Lord that there is no room for the seed of another to take root. In this parable, he makes no mention of the one preaching the gospel, toiling over the ground to make it good. He speaks of a wonderful rest and a participation in the work of the seed. In knowing Him, we rest. He says, He sleeps and rises. And the seed grows. He knows not how. We sleep and rise in the seed to death and resurrection. Night and then day in the day of the Lord. We got a children's book that I love. Uh, Frog and Toad. They, uh, they've got one little story in there where Toad plants a garden and he goes out there and he looks, he looks for the seed to grow and he... he it, 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 next day, there's no. He doesn't see the see the blade. He, he doesn't see anything happening. And he goes out there and he tries to sing to the seed. He, ah, he he tries to sing to it. Still, nothing grows. And he tries to play his fiddle for the seed. Still, nothing grows. And then he he shouts at the seed, "Grow, seed, grow!" He's completely worn out trying to get the seed to grow. He says, "This I think I scared the seed. My point in just saying all that is that this, this, by looking in the earth and looking at ourselves, there is no, it's never going to be fast enough. The, the, the increase of Christ will never be enough if we look at, if we look at things outwardly. Part of the Lord dealing with our heart and the work of the Spirit coming from this man to this man is that we this is this man is no longer in view. When Moses saw the Lord on Mount Sinai, this is the one he saw, and he built the tabernacle accordingly. The Lord said, Make a tabernacle that I might dwell with you. And he saw this three-part spirit soul body on the mount on Mount Sinai. <clears throat> it was after he had received the Ten Commandments and the law was broken, and he and the law was thrown down and broken. And he went to the Lord as the mediator, and he asked for forgiveness for the people. And he said, and Moses said to the Lord, "Show me your glory." And the Lord appeared. 
And when he came back down, he had a second set of commandments. It's like the second man. It's, it came with a glorious shining face. So Moses brought the law, which is written on our hearts. It's, it's, it's a picture of Christ. Moses came down from Mount Sinai, Exodus 34, verse 29. And when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two stones in his hands, he was not conscious that his face was shining. Moses didn't even wasn't looking at himself. His heart was fixed to know on the Lord. He wasn't even aware of his own shining, of his own glory. Because he wasn't looking here, he wasn't looking in the earth. His heart was fixed on above at the right hand of God. I'm talking about a God consciousness here where He is conscious of the, of the Lord, the Spirit. Not a self-consciousness. A view of Christ will deliver you from judging according to the flesh, from seeing, seeing things outwardly, judging yourself outwardly, Listen to this. In Matthew 25, where Jesus talks about the judgment and the sheep and goats. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry? and feed you thirsty and give you drink. When did we were, were you a stranger and we, we welcomed you? When did, were you naked and we clothed you? Look at how these sheep don't know that they're doing anything. They're not looking at themselves. They're not self-aware. They are unaware that they were feeding Him, giving Him drink, clothing Him, and visiting Him. It's so easy for people to hear what I'm saying and think that I'm talking about just stop looking at yourself, sit back and relax, it'll all happen. I don't know. I'm not saying sit back and relax. I'm saying that we need to see Christ revealed in us. And and only seeing Him transforms. I'm not saying sit back and relax, rest. I'm saying that our sufficiency is of God and not of us. The eye has doesn't have sight in itself. If you've ever been to there's a cave near here where they turn the lights out and they leave leave them out and you're in the and you're in a place with complete darkness where there's no light at all and you can sit there for 3 hours and your eyes will not adjust you will not see it is it is black 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 there is no sight and you have not the ability to see in your own eyes your eyes are not sufficient for sight they have to be filled with light that's what I'm seeing in this soul, in this new creation. It, it is Christ. It is the light filling a house. But of ourselves, we, we cannot. We have it not in ourselves. And so, we wait on the Lord. And those that wait on Him will renew their strength. And they'll mount up with wings as eagles. What does it say? He gives power to the weary and those who have no strength. He increases might. Even though youths are wearied and fatigued and young men utterly stumble, those expecting Yahweh pass to power. They raise up on wings as eagles. They run and are not fatigued. 
They go on. They do not faint. Our view, our, this seeing of Christ is not looking for manifestations of Christ. and We are not looking for fruit. We are looking for the life of the tree of life. The world seeth me no more, but ye see me because I live, you shall live also. Though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now, from now on, know we Him no more. 2 Corinthians 5, 16. Only as in His appearing can we know Him living now in His body, the church. His coming began at Pentecost. The Lord was already present in His body when He appeared to Paul. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? When Jesus appeared to Saul of Tarsus, He had already come to reside in union with His body, the church. There's a very practical outworking of this appearing of Christ, of the revelation of Christ. It's love. In seeing Him, in His coming, we begin to know Him and relate with Him in our relationships with one another. In seeing Him in His coming, we begin to love one another by loving Him. If any man say, I love God and hateth this brother, he's a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? In this commandment we have from him, that he that loveth God loveth also his brother. This, it, it requires us to see Christ in union with his body, to love his body. By him. You cannot love and love God and hate your brother because Jesus Christ presently resides in your brother as his very life right now. We deceive ourselves in thinking that God is afar off and separate from our brother. Maranatha, the Lord has come. Christ is in each brother who is truly born of God. And yes, even in the brother whose ignorance of the coming and the presence of Christ. So Father, reveal Your Son in us. Lord, reveal Your Son in us that we would be able to love by You. Look on Him and love Him. You cannot truly love God or His church without knowing Him in His appearing. If we see Jesus Christ as if He were far away, then we cannot love our brother by His life. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said this three times. Jesus said it three times because he was showing Peter his union with his sheep. Can you hear that? Do you love me? Feed my sheep. He's, he's do you hear the Holy Spirit declaring the same union? Why persecutest thou me? I'm one with my sheep. Feed my sheep. Do you love love me? He, Jesus said this in many ways. In Ma Matthew 10, verse 40, He said, The one receiving you receives me. And the one receiving me receives Him who sent me. To the sheep and the goats, He said, Truly I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of these, you did, the least of my brothers, you did it to me. If 
the Father, Jesus, is always looking past the many. He is seeing the one. This is the Father's house. He is the perfect man. At the end of 1 Corinthians, Paul writes, If anyone doth not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. Maranatha. And the translation is, Let him be cursed. The Lord has come. Therefore we judge no man according to the flesh. Father, reveal Your Son in us that we would not judge each other according to the flesh. Father, let Your view be in us. Lord, look, let, us, let our hearts be filled with Your understanding. We can look past. We know You. That we could say with David, Whom have I in heaven but Thee? And there is none upon the earth that I desire besides Thee. Father, reveal Your Son. I think that's a good stopping point.